So good morning, Zoe. How are you? I'm great, Jamie. How are you? Very good, thanks. Thank you so much for making the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. And we've talked briefly before, but only ever, you know, on direct messages. So it's great to talk almost in person. But as I've explained, this is a series of conversations about people's personal philosophy and how they'd answer the two deepest questions in philosophy, what's real and what matters morally. And I'm doing it in the context of trying to promote a very simple worldview called sentientism, which answers those two questions by saying, when it comes to what's real, we should use evidence and reason and take a naturalistic approach to building our beliefs. And when it comes to what matters, the clue is in the name that we should have a compassion, we should have moral consideration for all sentient beings, any being that's able to experience anything, suffering or flourishing. But having said that, I'm talking to people who disagree with sentientism as well as agree with it. So, you know, don't feel restricted. We'll see where the conversation goes, but it would be fascinating to understand your, your perspective on those two central questions. But before we get started, for people who don't know of you and your work, how would you best introduce yourself? I would say the, what captures me most is the term humane educator. So I co-founded and am the president of the Institute for Humane Education. And those two words together, humane education, mean a few different things. One is that it's a field that teaches about the interconnected issues of human rights and animal protection and environmental sustainability. And that's the field. And I'm an educator. That is my form of creating change in the world. And I like to think I'm also humane as a human being, or I strive to be humane. So. I would say that term sums up who I am. I do a lot of different things under the umbrella of that term. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I was put in touch with you by two of my previous guests, Mark Beckoff and Kevin Saldano, who both um, spoke very highly of your inspirational work with the Institute. Well, um, to be here. So to get us started, the first question I like to center these conversations around is what's real? So for many people, that's a story about whether they grew up in a naturalistic or a religious or a spiritual setting, how their epistemology, the way they think about what's really shifted over time, if it has. So I, yeah, I'd be fascinated to know your personal philosophical journey on that front. And you can go back as far in time as you like. Thank you. It's really fun to get questions like these because they invite you to and look at the arc of your life and your thinking. And so I really appreciate the question. And I grew up in a, a non-religious home. I'm Jewish by, well, by blood, basically, because yeah. we didn't really do anything that was, we didn't celebrate any Jewish holidays. We celebrated Christmas as a, as a secular event, Easter egg hunts as a secular event, wouldn't yeah. do that now, except maybe with vegan, fair trade, slave-free chocolate eggs. So I grew up in that kind of home. And when I was in college, a friend of a friend who was also Jewish and secular Jewish kid who grew up not far from me, he was traveling and he was in Israel and he was taken under the wing by an Orthodox Jew. And he ended up going to yeshiva and becoming an Orthodox Jew himself. He was very eager to meet people who were like him, who had grown up secular and to persuade them that they should be Orthodox. I was happy to meet with him and when he came back to campus. And he told me that I had this label, Jew, but I didn't know what it meant. And that was absolutely true. I did not know what it meant. Yeah. I was going through a pretty difficult time. It was my sophomore year in college. And suffice it to say, it was not the best period of my life. Yeah. So. That summer, I was in New York City where I grew up, and I found these courses, free courses taught by Orthodox Jews at NYU in the evening. And I was working all day to save up enough money to go on this program the following fall called Semester at Sea, where I'd be traveling around the globe on a ship with 400 fellow students and 30 faculty. And so... Every day after work, I would walk from the office where I worked down to NYU's campus. 
And I would take these courses with these Orthodox Jews. And they, it was such an awakening. It was fascinating. And I loved it. And there was meaning and there was purpose and there was community. And they were asking all these epistemological questions like you are. Yeah. Uh, but grounding it in this belief in God. And I didn't believe in God. And so I kept asking them to prove it to me. And they would try. One thing about, I would say, I and mean, this is a stereotype, but I would say about Jews in general is it is fine to debate. It yes. is ask questions. No, And fundamentally, what you do matters more than what you believe. And so the religion is very much steeped in following rules, like following Jewish law. The practice. Yes. And I remember one of my teachers, who I'm still in touch with today, I just, I, every time he'd offer me a proof of God, it just didn't seem like a proof. And so he finally said to me, so it doesn't matter what you believe, it matters what you do. And even though what he meant is it matters that you follow Jewish law, yeah. I took it to mean something just, it, it was hugely transformative for me. It meant that my life, I had to make sure that what I did mattered. And anyway, I was fascinated by religion. And when I then went on semester at sea, I, religion was my focus. So I stayed in an ashram when I was in India. I lived with a Hasidic family in um, Israel when I, we visited there. When I was in Japan, I was going to different temples and talking to different religious leaders. And so that interest stayed with me. How do people make meaning? How do people understand their roles? How, what does religion teach us about that? So eventually, I was choosing between going back to school to take all the science courses that were like pre-veterinary science courses to consider becoming a veterinarian yeah, or go study religion. That's where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> what a choice. I know. And I, I decided to go the religion route. It was a lot easier for me <laughs> than doing all those science courses. So I ended up going to Harvard Divinity School and getting a master's in theological studies. So it wasn't a um, practitioner's degree. It was a, an academic degree. And I studied world religions. And specifically, I focused on what those religions taught about animals and the environment. Because simultaneously, I was, I was becoming an ac activist for animals. And I had and for the environment. I had also been very uh, passionate about human rights and social justice issues. Yeah. And then I found out about what was happening to animals and got very redirected toward that. So I still don't believe in God, the way God is described in most religions. Mm -hmm. For me, the mystery of the universe, the mystery of consciousness, the mystery of existence is awe-inspiring overwhelming, incomprehensible. And in a strange way, in the way that maybe people who are believers think of God as, as the answer, to me, God narrows down that mystery that we can never know, that incomprehensible incredibleness that can set my heart racing and have tears streaming down my face as I'm looking at stars at yeah. night. That mystery, calling that mystery God and saying God intervenes and God, all of the stories about God feels like it's narrowing something huge into something kind of small. And I know that must, for a believer, that must sound crazy yeah. um, because God is everything. But for me, the word doesn't. It, it's almost constraining the concept into something that looks remarkably like a human male. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's like taking that awe and wonder and amazingness and just saying, no, actually, it's really just a, like another type of very powerful person with a personality and with an ethic who's judging us. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. it feels restrict, restricting the, the wonder rather than really reveling in it. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, there's an echo there in my own thinking because I get, I have quite a hard-edged naturalistic 
way of thinking about things. I think ultimately there's matter and energy and patterns of information processing include including dark matter and dark energy and so much we don't understand. But I, I, I prefer to just believe things based on evidence and reason. And I'm quite comfortable not knowing things. There's so many things we don't know. And there may be things that ultimately it's impossible for us to ever know because we're just evolved apes. So who's to say we'll universally be able to know everything? So I'm quite comfortable with that uncertainty and that not knowing. But it's not just a sort of cold technical, technical sort of in, intelligence perspective. It also has an enormous emotional resonance as well. So that sense of awe and wonder and majesty that I think you, you feel, and also I think religious people feel, I feel that too, even in a completely naturalistic way of thinking. So as you say, looking up at the Milky Way or experiencing time with your family, at least when the teenagers are in a good mood, those sorts of things can have a really rich emotional resonance. I think it's probably very similar to what people with a supernatural worldview feel. But I think with a naturalistic way of thinking, rather than saying, here's an answer, so we don't need to think anymore, we don't need to look anymore, we don't need to find out. My response to that awe and wonder is to want to learn more and want to understand more and want to keep digging. And that doesn't undermine the wonder. I think, if anything, it enriches it. So that's, yeah, it's a fascinating perspective. Yeah. It, thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I feel really similarly. And I can also say, so for um, many years, I attended Unitarian Universalist mm. services because you don't have to believe in anything except being a good person. Yeah. <laughs> and and I would find myself singing hymns and feeling that numinous experience and al almost always tearing up when I would sing hymns. And so, boy, I really do understand when people who are religious feel like the rest of us are really missing something. Yeah. Because when you're religious and when you are part of a religious community and when you pray and when you sing hymns and all of that, you connect to those feelings more often and more readily. And I understand the perspective that a secular life is missing something really profound. And I can say that I experienced that really profound thing too. Yeah. But I have to make more of an effort because in our technological world, I could just watch something on Netflix every night and just yeah. uh, not connect with that because there's not a, a drive that if you don't connect with it, you could go to hell, that there are motivating factors that keep somebody who's religious in that realm that... Yeah disappears a little if you live a more secular life. Yeah, as well as, I guess, traditional and societal patterns and habits and rituals and ways of being and buildings to be in that just make that a more everyday, you know, or at least every week way of accessing those types of experiences. So I think that's a very good point in, the, in a sort of secular worldview to access those things. We need to actually concentrate on them and work on them sometimes and make sure we get that, we get that goodness too. But one of the other as interesting aspects about that supernatural or religious worldview we'll link on to the second question about what matters and morality because you hinted at it already sometimes the motivation for people to stay in that religious pattern of practice and belief is one of a sort of external judgment is one that there will be hell or heaven as a reward or a punishment and in a way that was one of the things that personally turned me away from quite a gentle religious upbringing one was the epistemological stuff of as you said look the evidence just doesn't stack up for the things you're saying are true. But was also, there was a lot of rich compassion that flowed through the religion I was most familiar with and the ones I studied. That almost universal compassion was a constant amongst most religions. There was also a lot of really problematic ethics that to me felt very human <laughs> in, in its origins. It felt like the sort of thing powerful male might have dreamt up a couple of thousand years ago, not some sort of enlightened, perfect moral moral standards. So I think it's an interesting mix from the people I've spoken to who have moved away from a supernatural way of thinking. For some people, it's more the evidence and reason. And for some people, it's more, hold on, that seems homophobic or sexist, or what the hell is the caste system? And, and it's the ethics that turns them away. But one of the reasons why I think people you know, are drawn into a religious worldview or, or are nervous about moving away from it is because it does provide some form of moral foundation. 
And I think it's poorly founded and often warped in very harmful ways, but it's still a foundation, right? Because as you say, there's a perfect judge, there's heaven and hell, there's punishment, there's a reward, there's commandments or the Torah or the Quran and there's a list of rules to follow. It's at least a structure. And some people are worried that if you move away from that and you move to a secular or a naturalistic worldview, that you'll lose your moral foundations. That's clearly not something that doesn't apply to me. And it certainly doesn't apply to you given your life's work. How would you describe what you think matters morally and why does it matter morally given that neither of us have a supernatural belief system? Great question. So I have to tell you that that same um, young man who told me I had this label Jew that I didn't understand, mm. w- in one of our conversations, he said to me that without God, there'd be no reason not to go out and kill someone. Yeah. <laughs> and have you done that since? I have, <laughs> no. but really glad he found religion because he said that God was certainly the only reason that prevented him from doing that. And I, it, it was so strange to me. Okay, whatever it takes to keep you from killing people. But <laughs> the strange thing to admit. I know. It was so fascinating to me. And okay, so the philosophy that I live by is what I call the MOGO principle. And it's short for most good, which is short for doing the most good and the least harm. And this is not some crazy philosophy, obviously. This is just the golden rule, which is in every religious tradition and secular tradition that just... Yeah, uh, you know. and, pre- and predates them all. <laughs> exactly. And the idea of doing the most good and least harm, I extend to people, animals, and the environment. Mm. And even further, through all of our choices, our personal choices, like what we eat and what we wear the transportation we use, all of that, and then moving more deeply into the work we do, into our volunteerism, into our charitable donations, all of those pieces, how can we do the most good and the least harm to everyone? It is such a simple philosophy. And I have asked thousands of people in my career as a humane educator, whether they think that this is a philosophy that's good to live by. And not a single person has said, no, I don't think that's a good philosophy by which to live. Obviously, I haven't done a scientific study about it. I've just asked thousands of people, but it's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, it really is. And yeah. if if people don't disagree with it, then the question becomes, okay, if that's a good principle by which to live, how do I do that? So I wrote a book called Most Good Least Harm to help people on that journey of how you do that. And we're never, ever going to be perfect at it. And what to me might be the best or the the MOGO choice, the most good choice might not be the same one that you make. But if we're striving for that, and if we're striving for it honestly, and without judging everybody else on their process, but really considering it a collaborative effort to learn what that means, then I think that helps us to build a, a more peaceful and just and sustainable and humane world. But it's not everything. So in order to live by this principle, because we live within so many systems that are unjust and unsustainable and inhumane, we can't just make personal choices that will be perfectly mogo. It just yeah. And so because of that, it then becomes our responsibility to work to transform those systems. And when I say systems, I mean our political system, economic system, our energy system, our food system, our education system, our transportation system, infrastructure, all of these systems. We are embedded in them. You and I right now are talking through our computers. Our computers are filled with ores and different things that have been mined in unsustainable ways, unjust ways, potentially. And when the short lives of our computers are done, they're going to be disposed of and they can be disposed of by being recycled in a better way. Often what happens is that people who in other countries who are living in poverty are then taking out components of our computers. And so here you and I may be talking about how we can 
do things in the most humane and sustainable way, but we can't disenfranchise ourselves or, or disentangle ourselves from these systems. So then it becomes our responsibility to work to change those systems. Yeah. So it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I like it. And I think so much of the world of philosophy, to my mind, and maybe it's just because I'm not clever enough to understand a lot of philosophy, seems to have delved into enormously abstruse, really arcane, detailed, complex trolley problems, when actually I think the foundations are really simple. As you say, as, as long as you've taken a decision to be moral, then a principle like yours of just doing the most good, thinking very richly about all the consequences of our actions, not just as an individual, but through the systems we're part of and that we drive and, and so on. I don't see how you could really disagree with it, but obviously many people do. So I have a lot of affinity with that. And in a way, it's very consistent with this sentientism idea, because in a way, it's saying that what matters morally is the subjective experiences of humans and animals that are able to suffer and to experience. And it doesn't tell us anything beyond that, but it says we should at least have compassion for and have consideration for all of those entities. And suffering is bad and flourishing is good, right? Which <laughs> it's, it's not rocket science, but it, it seems like a solid naturalistic foundation for morality because it's grounded in an understanding of the real world, however imperfect that understanding might be, an understanding personally of what it's like to suffer and flourish and to enjoy things and not enjoy things, an understanding that you probably also don't like suffering and nor do other humans or un, other non-human animals. So it's a fairly logical extension of our own preferences to some degree and a compassion for, for others, which in essence is what morality is once you've moved away from the supernatural morality. So I have a lot of affinity with it. But one of the really interesting challenges is that I think many people might agree with that foundation of doing the most good. But when you say, okay, what do you mean by good? They would say the, for the benefit of others. And you'd say, which others do you mean? So there are a number of different challenges because there are clearly some people who, when they think about doing good for others, only count some humans, and then they discount or deprecate some other forms of humans. And we know the problems of a variety of different forms of discrimination, whether that's sex, gender, race, sexuality, caste, the list goes on. Right. So those people will still say, I'm doing the most good, but just for a subset of people that I care about, and the others I care about less. And we, I think you and I would share a perspective that's flawed, and we should have a compassion for all humans, regardless of those characteristics. Many other people will then stop there. And I say, at least conceptually fine, I'll grant compassion for all humans, but they will only selectively grant compassion for non-humans. They might care about certain charismatic wildlife, for example, but they won't care about the less charismatic wildlife, or they certainly won't care about farmed animals and so on. And uh, it would be interesting to know how your journey progressed through your life. Did you start out with a very sort of direct appreciation for the moral value of non-humans as well? Or is that something you came to over time? It'd be interesting to know that journey of. I was one of those kids who just loved animals and. You yeah. Know, right from the start. Yeah. And growing up in Manhattan, I would stop for every dog on the street. So I just, I loved animals from when I was really young, but I will say something in relationship to humans that you just touched upon that was true for me for a very young age, which was, so my parents would listen to the news every night, so it would be on, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so I, I was young during the Vietnam War, and every yeah. night on the news, just hearing about how many Americans had died, and this was then true later, after the Vietnam War, in any event, even a natural disaster that happened somewhere else. Yeah. Um, always report how many Americans had died. And I remember from a very young age, um, wondering why American lives were more important than other lives. Yeah. Why was the news only reporting on American lives when there was some sort of natural disaster? And this wasn't, I, I wouldn't, some people might hear this and say, oh, you lack patriotism, but it's not about that. It's about, and I later came to study this more and find this really fascinating, that we humans did not evolve to think and care about 8 billion others of us. We evolved yeah. about our family, our tribe, our clan, and 
And I understand that that makes perfect sense. And yet it, we now live in a globalized world where our choices impact other people and other species around the world. And even so we have our evolutionary minds and then we have our modern realities Mm. and it requires that we evolve in terms of our morality. If we're going to impact, if we're going to have a chocolate bar that's causing some child to live in slavery, that is a moral responsibility. Now you asked about animals and for me, loving animals and then finding out about what was happening to them created a huge conflict. Yeah. I was one of those kids. I loved meat. I didn't care about anything else that was served for dinner. I just wanted the meat. Yeah. So I was not, I'm vegan. I've been vegan now for 31 years, but I did not go. Those people are like, I never liked meat anyway. No, that was not me. (laughs) And I remember becoming an avid Star Trek fan um, when I was 13 years old. And in one episode, you know, Mr. Spock, the Vulcan, the logical Vulcan, he was vegetarian. And he would say, I don't understand how you can eat these other animals. So he was vegetarian purely for reasons of logic. Yeah. And it struck me. I remember that coming in a little bit and then saying to my mom, I'm thinking about becoming vegetarian, all because of Mr. Spock. And and then as soon as I said that, I followed it up with, but I guess it doesn't really matter because the animals are already dead who I'm eating. And my mom, she did not want me to become a vegetarian. So she did not disabuse me of the fault. Yeah. Of and she said, yeah, that's right. So I kept eating meat and I didn't understand the sort of laws of economics and supply and demand and all of that until later. And it was actually around the same time that that friend of the friend, the the Jewish guy who talked to me, I became vegetarian. I thought, okay, I the conflict between what I really know to be true and my actions was too great. And so I made that shift then and then continued to move further along that path. And it's so much easier now than it was 31 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. And pretty, if, if clean meat becomes a reality, meaning cultured meat becomes a reality and becomes cost effective, what's really interesting to me as a humane educator is I've been teaching about these issues now for um, almost three decades or for three decades. Mm. And, and, There are so many people who, upon learning about factory farming, the cruelty involved in their diet, and they know it's awful. They see that it's awful, but they're not willing to make a change. But when we change the system, if we simply had a system where you go to the grocery store and there's your cultured meat and you can buy it, then that then we can just end animal agriculture. So I am, I haven't really talked too much yet about what it means to be a solutionary, Mm. which is what in humane education, we're trying to educate people to be solutionaries. And by that, people who can identify unjust, unsustainable, inhumane systems, and then devise solutions that do the most good and the least harm for everyone. So to me, the idea of cultured need, that's an exciting solutionary solution, because it can, it, it has the power to change an entire system so that people don't have to participate in that system or nobody has to participate in that system, but so that people aren't required to make it all about their personal choice. And we just change the system, Mm. make it easy for everybody because most people will go along with whatever systems there are and will not make the effort to make personal choices that do the most good and the least harm to the degree that maybe you or I are willing to do that. Not everybody's like that. And that's not a judgment. That's not saying I'm better than those people. It's a matter of just saying we are really different. For me, it is a driving force to, to strive to make those kinds of choices. And for other people, it's not, but they'd be pa- very happy to go along with systems. And often those people are among uh, those people, that sounds so st- like a, a huge generalization, but I often find that some of the same people who wouldn't be willing to change their diet, for example, 
would be willing to open their home and allow refugees to come live with them and to give everything they have and to be unbelievably generous in ways that I haven't been in my life. So again, no judgment, just like, how do we solve this? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and we'll come back to that in the final section as well, because I think your work about a solutionary mindset is absolutely central to how we make the world a better place. Because as you say, it's remarkably rare for people to just do some moral thinking and then to change their behavior partly because of those systems that we're all part of, as you say, some of them are formal, some of them informal, but also because most of us are pretty much indoctrinated from almost from birth into doing things in a very different way. And those social norms and those habits and those traditions can hold us very tight. It was an embarrassingly long journey for me to eventually go vegan a few years ago. So for, for many decades, I wasn't a bad person, but I was almost deliberately not avoiding thinking about what I knew to be true because it was going to be socially awkward to, to make the change. And that's, it's a, it's a shame, but that is a fact of the matter. Yeah. But before, before we come on to the solutionary bit, one other interesting thing about what matters that I'm interested in your view on is it's really clear from your work that you talk about humans, non-human animals and the environment as well. And there's a few different perspectives there. So the sentientist starts on the environment, it sees the environment and non-sentient stuff, things that can't experience things, rocks and rivers and probably plants and trees and so on, as deeply important, but it sees them as deeply important because of their impact on sentient beings, the the animals and the humans that live in those environments. And that's not just cold, hard ecosystem services. It's also a rich aesthetic appreciation for living in a beautiful environment. It's all that wonder. So in a way, there's a lot of overlap between a sentientist perspective on the environment and someone who cares you know, about the environment more generally, but it's still a step removed. Whereas there are other people who, uh, the technical term might be a biocentrist or an ecocentrist, who will actually see intrinsic direct moral value in rocks and plants and ecosystems and species and habitats, independent of the sentient beings, if that makes sense. So they'll, they'll care about those things intrinsically, even though those things can't directly suffer. And I'm interested in where your philosophy is on that, because yeah, I'd just love to know whether it's more of an instrumental thing because you care about suffering and flourishing or whether you actually think environments have a deep intrinsic moral value themselves. So for me, that's a both and rather than an or, and I don't know whether I've actually thought whether an environment per se has intrinsic moral value does a Mm. mountain have intrinsic moral value as outside of what you just said outside of the fact that it's a habitat for sentient beings and i don't i don't i probably haven't thought about that question because it doesn't ultimately matter to me on the other hand i can say that as a person who draws so much of my own sort of internal sustenance from nature the natural world does have intrinsic value in it. it, But that's just very personal because it does me and it does human beings. So it's not a question I think about. Yeah. And I, and it's interesting because the thought experiment would be if you imagined a mountain on a distant planet in a solar system, in a galaxy that will never be visited by any sentient being, will never be seen, will never be experienced. Does it matter morally? And my technical answer will be no. But I think you you make a really important point about our environment here on this planet, which is it, in a way it doesn't matter that much because whether it's instrumental or intrinsic, we still care about it because either way, it's really important for all the sentient beings too. And I guess the only reason I raise it as a question and why I sometimes get quite specific about it is partly because I think many people like you are open to a broader moral circle, right? That includes the environment but you're not excluding any of the sentient beings. You have a rich appreciation for wild animals of all sorts and farmed animals of all sorts and all humans. And so I see very little danger or risk in expanding beyond that sentient moral circle, as long as you don't exclude any sentient. But, and I'll, I might annoy some environmentalists, but the center of gravity of the environmental movement to me seems to be very different. It seems to have gone from an anthropocentric concern about humans a sense that we're threatened by climate change and damage to the environment that we're largely driving ourselves, and then broadens the moral scope in a very generous way to include ecosystems and habitats and 
mountains, rocks, rivers, and plants, but still conveniently excludes most wild animals and most, certainly most farmed animals from the moral concern. So they seem to have broadened their moral circle, but conveniently for humans, <laughs> excluded vast billions and trillions of sentient beings that actually do suffer. And that I do find frustrating in that someone's almost gone beyond where I would go with moral consideration, but has excluded many obviously sentient beings and disregards their perspective. But uh, So that's partly why I, sometimes I ask that question. I, it's, what, what I see often is that there will be an environmental concern with species, but not with individual members of that species. Yeah. So, and, and there are conflicts that occur between an environmental and an animal rights perspective or between yeah. an environmental in a human rights perspective, you can have an introduced species that is driving the, the loss of other species because that species doesn't belong there. And so the environmentalists might say, we need to eradicate that species, whatever it takes. And maybe we are doing it in the least cruel ways, but we're still killing them. Mm. And so that is a real conflict because there are sentient beings on both ends that yep. are one is going to suffer at the other's expense. The same thing happens, let's say, in the United States, in the Pacific Northwest, in the 1990s, there was this huge conflict when the northern spotted owl was put on the endangered species list because it meant that you could no longer cut down the forests, which were the habitat for this owl. And all around the Pacific Northwest, lawn signs started sprouting up, which were, I support loggers or I support the owl. And it was, to me, this is a perfect example of this is a legitimate conflict yeah. between the needs of two different species, humans and owls and all the other animals, of course, who live in those forests. But instead of talking about what can we do to solve this problem in a way that protects the forest and ensures that loggers have training for different jobs or we selective logging or something, like what can we do? to make sure vast numbers of people do not lose their livelihoods. And that was not the, the focus. The focus yeah. was what side are you on? Yeah, yeah. And I, f I find that frustrating because there are so many challenging problems like that are really difficult problems and I don't have an answer for them and philosophy of like sentientism doesn't have the answer either. All it says is that we should at least have compassion as we're thinking through those difficult problems, have compassion for each of the individual sentient beings that's impacted. That includes the humans. And at least by having that moral consideration for all of those sentient beings, we're, we've got a better chance of finding a more of a MOGO star solution. Whereas if we don't, if we exclude some of those beings from even being counted or involved in the calculation, we definitely won't. And while there are many really challenging problems where interests do conflict and there are different sets of needs that are incompatible, you've hinted already at some really obvious solutions that just win straight down the line. For example, you know, animal farming, where it's bad for the non-human animals, it's bad for wild animals, it's bad for human animals, it's bad for the environment. So in a way, I'm reassured sometimes by the fact that, yes, there are some really difficult problems, but often the biggest problems are actually are relatively straightforward to fix if only we had the will. But no, that, thank you. That was really interesting to understand how you play in the environment. And obviously our mutual friend, although I've only met him once now, Mark Beckoff, his work around compassionate conservationism is trying to square that circle and try and build that compassion into you know, an, an environmental ethos as well. But that brings us on to the final uh, topic about how do you see the future developing? Because I think we are in this situation where you and I share a fairly naturalistic way of thinking, using evidence to try and understand reality and engage honestly with reality to understand it imperfectly, and a, and a broad compassion that cares about all different types of suffering and all different types of sentient beings. And it almost seems self-evidently and solidly true to us. I think it would take some remarkable evidence to shift us away from those perspectives. But most people on the planet disagree at the moment in some way, shape or form. They either have some form of supernatural belief system that often actually warps their ethical approach as well and restricts or makes their compassion conditional or just their ethical stance is different. They might exclude some types of humans or some types of sentient beings from their consideration in the practical decisions they take. So in that slightly frustrating situation, because as you've already said, just the force of moral argument, we know it's just not enough. How do you see the future developing and what are the best ways of making that happen? And you've introduced this idea of a solutionary way of thinking already, but yeah, do you want to 
lay that out a little bit more? Because I've seen you also talk about contrasting a humanitarian approach, and you're saying let's extend that by looking at root causes and real solutions, but also let's extend it so it's not just humanitarian. It's also, if you like, sentientarian, because we need to care about non-human animals as well. But yeah, what, how, how do you think the future might develop and how can we best make it, make the world a better place? So before I answer that question, which I'm very excited to answer, I just want to say, going back to your last question, that it's not just environmentalists who compartmentalize. Animal, animal activists do this too. Oh, yes. I have been so sort of surprised that there, there are so many advocates for companion animals who would do anything for dogs and cats while they're also eating farmed animals and yeah. and resent the comparison between a, a pig and a dog, even though in terms of all the studies, they're equally sentient and able to feel and, and intelligent and all of those things that, to me, I don't really care about who's the smartest on the block. But, yeah. uh, uh, but and anyone who follows Esther the Wonder Pig on Twitter will know already. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now to uh, switch into your question about how do we get to this world? Yeah. Where humans, non-human animals, and the environment are all treated with respect and care and where all life can thrive. And that's my goal. That's the mission of the Institute for Humane Education, is to educate people to create such a world. So the reason why... I have focused on education. It's twofold. The primary reason is because the educa education underlies, it's a system that underlies, it's at the root of all other societal systems. Mm. I believe that if we can educate a generation to be solutionaries, to adopt this MOGO principle and put it into action and be solutionaries in terms of changing the systems that surround us so that they're just and, and sustainable and humane. If we can do that, then we can build such a world. And I believe that is the most strategic approach. Now it's a long-term approach. Yeah. And this isn't to say that everybody should be doing this approach. So the second reason why I have focused on this approach is because it aligns with what I'm passionate about, I like doing, and I'm good at. So anybody who's watching this, I would invite them to think about what issues concern you most, what are you good at, and what do you love to do? Because if you can find the place where the answer to those three questions meet, then you could spend the rest of your life doing this good work and really create a lot of positive change. So Somebody who says, I am passionate about ending factory farming. I'm a scientist and I'm really good at that. And I love doing that. Maybe they are on the cutting edge of creating plant-based and clean meats, cultured meats. Perfect. Yeah. That their solutionary work. My solutionary work is changing the education system. So for those two reasons, I'm, I've am dedicated my life to this. At the core of solutionary work is two things. It's bringing a solutionary lens to problems and cultivating solutionary thinking. So when, when I say a solutionary lens, it means that you look at problems and you think a few things. They're solvable. And my goal is to uh, learn from all stakeholders and collaborate so that I can solve that problem. So a solutionary lens means you don't come in with the sort of uh, argumentative attitude. You come in with a, let's solve this attitude. And that might sound simple, mm. but as um, activists readily know, we often come to things with a fight attitude rather than a, how do we solve this attitude? I can give you an example of that if we have time. So then there's solutionary thinking. So what comprises solutionary thinking? It's comprised of critical thinking, systems thinking, strategic thinking, and creative thinking. And even though those are not linear, they don't happen in a linear way, it is important that 
critical thinking lies at the foundation. Mm. If we can't know what's true, if we don't have the capacity to research and investigate and discover reality to the degree that we can, then we can't build on that. So then systems thinking comes next. Systems thinking is then, okay, we're doing our critical thinking. And what are all the systems that come into play? And you bring critical thinking to understanding those systems. And then when you are when you are thinking critically and when you are thinking in systems, you then have the opportunity to think strategically. Okay, I have all this information. Now, where are the leverage points where um, exerting a, a small impact can have a huge impact? And then ultimately, you you have all those working together, and then your creative juices are flowing, and you bring creativity. And that's how you become a solutionary. At the Institute for Humane Education, we are training people to be solutionaries. And we have loads of free downloadable resources at our website, humaneeducation.org. We have a solutionary hub, lots of teacher resources. We have a free solutionary guidebook. It's been translated now into five different languages. We have a, the, the solutionary guidebook is for educators. We also have a student and activist version called How to Be a Solutionary, also free. So all of these free resources. In April, we're launching a solutionary micro-credential program for teachers. It's a 30-hour program divided into three modules to help teachers understand the concept of being a solutionary, then practice it, understand the solutionary process, and then ultimately to create a plan, a solutionary application to bring it into their classrooms. And we also have graduate programs and they're online so people around the world can participate. They're with Antioch University and we have an MA, an MED, an EDD and a graduate certificate so that people who want to dive into humane education and learn about the connections between human rights, animal protection, environmental sustainability, culture and change, and then take all of that and teach about it in whatever ways they're going to teach, whether in classrooms or outside of classrooms. So those are, are some of our um, yeah. things. And I, and, and I love the approach partly, and I'm biased because it, it echoes, or I guess I'm echoing what you're doing in trying to re- promote this worldview of sentientism, because in a situation where the world is very complex and can be difficult to understand, and we might also have moral uncertainty about what are the right things to do. It feels like almost a safe type of intervention, one that's robust and should be good in almost any scenario, is to actually improve the way the 8 billion humans on the world th- of the world think. And if we can get more people to be using evidence and reason, to be thinking creatively about solutions, to be understanding systems, and to be motivated by a much more universal compassion, that will spawn and accelerate all sorts of very specific positive improvements, hopefully. So it might feel like it's more sort of second order, but I think you're right. It has potentially a deep-seated strategic impact because if someone's shifted to adopt the way of thinking you're laying out, that has at least a small positive impact on every decision they take forever and every person they talk to. Yeah, hopefully those ripples will flow out. So in that context, how how optimistic do you feel about the future? Um, (laughs) Great question. It depends on the day. Yeah, Um, yeah. I feel like my optimism is evidence-based optimism. It's not pie in the sky, Pollyanna, general hopefulness. I look at the arc of history. I see all of the changes that have occurred in my lifetime. When I was born, it was illegal in many states for black and white people to marry. Yeah. When I was born- It's unimaginable to young people now. I know. And the idea of gay rights at the time I was born, it was not even an idea. There was no discussion about it. And I remember during, we have a one week residency optional for our graduate students. And they were here when the Supreme Court made gay marriage legal. And it happened, or I found out about it during our lunch break. And I came back and was resuming. And I just, I, my eyes filled with tears as I, I shared this with everybody. And that had happened. It, now, it had happened through decades of hard work. But on the other hand, it almost was like the blink of an eye. Yeah. In terms of how quickly shifts are happening in, in 
in certain realms. And even though more animals are being abused and killed than ever before because of the you know growth of meat eating and the growing human population, the consideration for and embrace of the rights of animals, or at least the protection of animals, that they should not be treated um, uh, abusively and cruelly, that is almost universal now that, yeah. that people believe that. So now, okay, let's put it into action for sure. We haven't done that yet, but I would say that my optimism is based on that. My optimism is based on the fact that the air is actually cleaner in New York City than when I was a child growing up in New York City. I don't live in New York anymore, but I believe we can do this. I also, I'm a, as I mentioned before, a big Star Trek fan. And I guess I think that the Star Trek future is possible. Now, yeah. I'm thinking everything about it is possible. I don't know that we'll be able to transport ourselves or even create warp speed and be able to travel outside of our solar system. But the concept of people no longer being prejudiced, no longer being racist and sexist, although the first Star Trek series was awfully sexist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's possible. These things are possible. And yeah. if they're possible, let's all just work toward making them happen. Yeah, that's an inspiring vision. That's a, a, a compassionate post-scarcity future, a Star <clears throat> Trek future. Yeah. And I think you're right. I can come across as too naively optimistic, but I think any social change feels way too painfully slow and frustrating and uncertain while you're going through it. But you don't have to look back then that many years or decades or centuries to see that change can happen very quickly, positive change. And I think we can do more of it, but it requires focus and dedication and you know, inspirational work like your own. Yeah. Thank you for laying out that vision. It's a great way to finish. Can I say one more thing about it? Of course, it? of course. Optimism is not a prerequisite. Hope and optimism are not prerequisites for doing this work. As I said at the beginning, it depends on the day. There are days when I don't feel hopeful and yeah. I don't feel optimistic, but that doesn't change what I do. And I think it's a really important point because each of us has to look in the mirror every day. And do you want to have respect for the person who looks back? And do you want to when you die one day, do you want to feel like you have self-respect, that you did the best you could? Yeah. So regardless of whether I feel hopeful or optimistic on a particular day, doesn't matter. Just do the work. Yeah. Love it. Just do the work. Do you want to try and make things better or not? And whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, the answer should be the same. Yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you. It's been a real inspiration to talk to you. If people want to follow you and learn more about your work and the work of the Institute, what's the best places people can find you? I'll include all the links in the show notes anyway, but if you wanted to point people at uh, uh, your accounts and your websites and so on. Thank you so much, Jamie. So the Institute for Humane Education, humaneeducation.org. And we are on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. And so check us out. And if I can be of help to anybody, just email me at zoe at humaneeducation.org. And Jamie, it's been really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Likewise, a real inspiration, Zoe. Thank you so much. Well, take care. I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day and stay in touch. Be well. <laughs>